Chapter Three, Chapter Four of Book Two of Les Miserables, Volume Five by Victor Hugo. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Peter Kelly. Les Miserables, Volume Five by Victor Hugo, translated by Isabel Florence Hapgood. Book Two, The Intestine of the Leviathan. Chapter Three, Brunissau. The sewer of Paris in the Middle Ages was legendary. In the sixteenth century, Henry the Second attempted a bore, which failed. Not a hundred years ago, the cesspool, Mercier attests the fact, was abandoned to itself and fared as best it might. Such was this Paris, delivered over to quarrels, to indecision, and to gropings. It was tolerably stupid for a long time. Later on. 89 showed how understanding comes to cities. But in the good old times, the capital had not much head. It did not know how to manage its own affairs, either morally or materially, and could not sweep out filth any better than it could abuses. Everything presented an obstacle. Everything raised a question. The sewer, for example, was refractory to every itinerary. One could no more find one's bearings in the sewer than one could understand one's position in the city above the unintelligible, below the inextricable. Beneath the confusion of tongues there reigned the confusion of caverns, Daedalus backed up by Babel. Sometimes the Paris sewer took a notion to overflow, as though this misunderstood Nile was suddenly seized with a fit of rage. There occurred, infamous to relate, inundations of the sewer. At times that stomach of civilization digested badly. The cesspool flowed back into the throat of the city and Paris got an aftertaste of her own filth. These resemblances of the sewer to remorse had their good points. They were warnings, very badly accepted, however. The city waxed indignant at the audacity of its mire, and did not admit that the filth should return. Drive it out better. The inundation of 1802 is one of the actual memories of Parisians of the age of 80. The mud spread in cross form over the Place de Victoire, where stands the statue of Louis the Fourteenth, It entered the Rue Saint-Honore by the two mouths to the sewer in the Champs-Élysées, the Rue Saint-Florentin through the Saint-Florentin sewer, the Rue pierre à Poisson through the sewer de la Saunière, the Rue Popincourt through the sewer of the Chemin Vert, the Rue de la Roquette through the sewer de la Lappe. It covered the drain of the Rue des Champs-Élysées to the height of 35 centimeters, and to the south, through the vent of the Seine, performed its functions in inverse sense. It penetrated the Rue Mazarin, the Rue de la Chaux, and the Rue des Marais, where it stopped at a distance of 109 meters, a few paces distance from the house in which Racine had lived, respecting, in the 17th century, the poet more than the king. It attained its maximum depth in the Rue Saint-Pierre, where it rose to the height of three feet above the flagstones of the water spout, and its maximum length in the Rue Saint-Sabin, where it spread out over a stretch of 238 meters in length. At the beginning of the century, the sewer of Paris was still a mysterious place. Mud can never enjoy a good fame, but in this case its evil renown reached the verge of the terrible. Paris knew in a confused way that she had under her a terrible cavern. People talked of it as of that monstrous bed of Thebes in which swarmed centipedes fifteen long feet in length and which might have served Behemoth for a bathtub. The great boots of the sewer men never ventured further than certain well-known points. We were then very near the epoch when the scavenger's carts, from the summit of which saint foy fraternized with Marquis de Crequy, discharged their loads directly into the sewer. As for cleaning out, that function was entrusted to the pouring rains, which encumbered rather than swept away. Rome left some poetry to her sewer and called it the Gemone. Paris insulted hers and entitled it the polypus hole. Science and superstition were in accord, in horror. The polypus hole was no less repugnant to hygiene than to legend. The goblin was developed under the fetid covering of the Mouffetard sewer. The corpses of the Mamusset had been cast into the sewer de la Brarillerie. Fagon attributed the redoubtable malignant fever of 1685 to the great hiatus of the sewer of the Marais which remained yawning until 1833 in the Rue Saint-Louis, almost opposite the sign of the gallant messenger. The mouth of the sewer 
of the Rue de la Materie was celebrated for the pestilences which had their source there. With its grating of iron, with points simulating a row of teeth, it was like a dragon's maw in that fatal street, breathing forth hell upon men. The popular imagination seasoned the sombre Parisian sink with some indescribably hideous intermixture of the infinite. The sewer had no bottom. The sewer was the lower world. The idea of exploring these leprous regions did not even occur to the police. To try that unknown thing, to cast the plummet into that shadow, to set out on a voyage of discovery in that abyss? Who would have dared? It was alarming. Nevertheless, someone did present himself. The cesspool had its Christopher Columbus. One day, in 1805, during one of the rare apparitions which the Emperor made in Paris, the Minister of the Interior, some de Cré or Crete or other, came to the Master's intimate levy. In the carousel there was the audible clanking of swords of all those extraordinary soldiers of the Great Republic and of the Great Empire. Then Napoleon's door was blocked with heroes. Men from the Rhine, from the Esco, from the Adige, and from the Nile. Companions of Joubert, of Dessay, of Marceau, of Hoc, of Clibert, the Aristiers of Fleurou, the Grenadiers of Mayence, the pontoon builders of Genoa, hussars whom the pyramids had looked down upon, artillerists whom Juno's cannonball had spattered with mud, cuirassiers who had taken by assault the fleet lying at anchor in the Zyder Zee. Some had followed Bonaparte from the bridge of Lodi. Others had accompanied Murat in the trenches of Mantua. Others had preceded Lan in the hollow road of Montebello. The whole army of that day was present there, in the courtyard of the Tuileries, represented by a squadron or a platoon, and guardian Napoleon in repose. And that was the splendid epoch when the Grand Army had Marengo behind it and Austerlitz before it. Sire, said the Minister of the Interior to Napoleon, yesterday I saw the most intrepid man in your empire. What man is that? said the Emperor briskly. And what has he done? He wants to do something, sire. What is it? To visit the sewers of Paris. This man existed, and his name was Brunissau. Chapter 4 Brunissau The visit took place. It was a formidable campaign, a nocturnal battle against pestilence and suffocation. It was, at the same time, a voyage of discovery. One of the survivors of this expedition, an intelligent working man, who was very young at the time, related curious details with regard to it several years ago, which Brunissau thought himself obliged to omit in his report to the prefect of police, as unworthy of official style. The processes of disinfection were, at that epoch, extremely rudimentary. Hardly had Brunissau crossed the first articulations of that subterranean network, when eight laborers out of the twenty refused to go any further. The operation was complicated. The visit entailed the necessity of cleaning, hence it was necessary to cleanse and at the same time to proceed, to note the entrances of water, to count the gratings and the vents, to lay out in detail the branches, to indicate the currents at the point where they parted, to define the respective bounds of the diver's basins, to sound the small sewers grafted on the principal sewer, to measure the height under the keystone of each drain, and the width at the spring of the vaults as well as at the bottom, in order to determine the arrangements with regard to the level of each water entrance, either of the bottom of the arch or on the soil of the street. They advanced with toil. The lanterns pined away in the foul atmosphere. From time to time a fainting sewerman was carried out. At certain points there were precipices. The soil had given away. The pavement had crumbled. The sewer had changed into a bottomless well. They found nothing solid. A man disappeared suddenly. They had great difficulty getting him out again. On the advice of Fourcroy, they lighted large cages filled with tow steeped in resin from time to time in spots which had been sufficiently disinfected. In some places the wall was covered with misshapen fungi. One would have said tumors. The very stone seemed diseased with this unbreathable atmosphere. Brunissau, in his exploration, proceeded downhill. At the point of separation of the two water conduits of the Grand Hulieu, he deciphered upon a projecting stone the date of 1550. 
This stone indicated the limits where Philibert de Lorme, charged by Henri II with visiting the subterranean drains of Paris, had halted. The stone was the mark of the 16th century on the sewer. Brunissau found the handiwork of the 17th century once more in the Ponceau drain of the Rue Vieille de Temple, vaulted between 1600 and 1650, and the handiwork of the 18th in the western section of the collecting canal, walled and vaulted in 1740. These two vaults, especially the less ancient, that of 1740, were more cracked and decrepit than the masonry of the belt sewer, which dated from 1412, an epoch when the brook of fresh water of the Menil Montan was elevated to the dignity of the Grand Sewer of Paris, an advancement analogous to that of a peasant who had become the first valet de chambre to the king, something like Gros Jean transformed into Le Bel. Here and there, particularly beneath the courthouse, they thought they recognized the hollows of ancient dungeons, excavated in the very sewer itself, hideous in pace. An iron neck collar was hanging in one of these cells. They walled them all up. Some of their finds were singular, among others the skeleton of an orangutan who had disappeared from the Jardin des Plans in 1800, a disappearance probably connected with the famous and indisputable apparition of the devil in the Rue de Bernardin in the last year of the 18th century. The poor devil had ended by drowning himself in the sewer. Beneath this long arched drain, which terminated at the Arche Marion, a perfectly preserved rag picker's basket excited the admiration of all connoisseurs. Everywhere, the mire, which the sewer men came to handle with intrepidity, abounded in precious objects jewels of gold and silver, precious stones, coins. If a giant had filtered this cesspool, he would have had the riches of centuries in his lair. At the point where the two branches of the Rue de Temple and the Rue saint avoye separate, they picked up a singular Huguenot medal in copper, bearing on one side the pig hooded with a cardinal's hat, and on the other a wolf with a tiara on his head. The most surprising rencounter was at the entrance to the Grand Sewer. This entrance had formerly been closed by a grating of which nothing but the hinges remained. From one of these hinges hung a dirty and shapeless rag, which, arrested there in its passage, no doubt, had floated there in the darkness and finished its process of being torn apart. Brunissau held his lantern close to this rag and examined it. It was a very fine batiste, and in one of the corners, less frayed than the rest, they made out a heraldic coronet and embroidered above these seven letters. L A V B E S P. The crown was the coronet of a marquis, and the seven letters signifying Laubespine. They recognized the fact that what they had before their eyes was a morsel of the shroud of Marat. Marat had, in his youth, had had amorous intrigues. This was when he was a member of the household of the Comte d'Artois, in the capacity of physician to the stables. From these love affairs, historically proved with a great lady, he had retained this sheet as a waif or a souvenir. At his death, as this was the only linen of any fineness which he had in his house, they buried him in it. Some old woman had shrouded him for the tomb in that swaddling band in which the tragic friend of the people had enjoyed voluptuousness. Brunissel passed on. They left that rag where it hung. They did not put the finishing touch to it. Did this arise from scorn or from respect? Marat deserved both. And then, destiny was there sufficiently stamped to make them hesitate to touch it. Besides, the things of the sepulchre must be left in the spot where they select. In short, the relic was a strange one. A marquise had slept in it. Marat had rotted in it. It had traversed the pantheon to the end with the rats of the sewer. This chamber rag, of which Watteau would formerly have joyfully sketched every fold, had ended in becoming worthy of the fixed gaze of Dante. The whole visit to the subterranean stream of filth of Paris lasted seven years, from 1805 to 1812. As he proceeded, Brunissau drew, directed, and completed considerable works. In 1808 he lowered the arch of the Ponceau, and everywhere created new lines. He pushed the sewer in 1809 under the Rue Saint-Denis, as far as the Fountain of the Innocents, in 1810 under the Rue foix manteau and under the Salpêtrière, in 1811 under the Rue Neuve de petit Père, under the Rue de Mer, under the Rue de la Charpe, under the Place Royale, in 1812 under the Rue de la Paix and under the Chalcy d'Antin. 
At the same time, he had the whole network disinfected and rendered healthful. In the second year of his work, Brunassau engaged the assistance of his son-in-law, Nargo. It was thus that, at the beginning of the century, ancient society cleansed its double bottom and performed the toilet of its sewer. There was that much clean at all events. Tortuous, cracked, unpaved, full of fissures, intersected by gullies, jolted by eccentric elbows, mounting and descending illogically, fetid, wild, fierce, submerged in obscurity, with cicatrices on its pavements and scars on its walls, terrible. Such was retrospectively viewed the antique sewer of Paris. Ramifications in every direction, crossings of trenches, branches, goose feet, stars, as in military mines, blind alleys, vaults lined with saltpeter, pestiferous pools, scabby sweats on the walls, drops dripping from the ceilings, darkness. Nothing could equal the horror of this old waste crypt, the digestive apparatus of Babylon. A cavern, ditch, gulf pierced with streets, a titanic mole burrow, where the mind seems to behold the enormous blind mole, the past prowling through the shadows, in the filth which has been splendor. This, we repeat, was the sewer of the past. End of Book 2, Chapter 4 Recording by Peter Kelly